Hello everybody, I am Ryan from Philosophy and More and today we're going to think about what is critical thinking. This is the start of a long series that will be coming throughout May about critical thinking and essay writing. Today we will be doing an introduction to critical thinking, then we will be looking at what critical thinking is, reasoning, why critical thinking skills matter, underlying skills and attitudes, self-awareness for accurate judgement, personal strategies for critical thinking, critical thinking in academic contexts, barriers to critical thinking, critical thinking, knowledge, skills and attitudes, priorities, developing critical thinking abilities and a quick summary at the end. In this video, I hope that you will understand by the end of it what critical thinking is, you will recognise some of the benefits associated with critical thinking skills, recognise the personal qualities associated with critical thinking, recognise barriers to the development of good critical thinking skills, and assess your current understanding of critical thinking and identify your priorities for improvement. This chapter may not seem like it's overly important compared to the other chapters which are upcoming in the series, however I think that it's important that we start with this video so that you can really understand what you're in for and also understand how you will be improving throughout the series. This chapter provides a general orientation to critical thinking. It examines what is meant by critical thinking, the skills associated with it and the barriers that can hinder effective development of critical approaches. Many people can find it difficult to order their thoughts in a logical, consistent and reasoned way. This book starts from, from the premise that skills in reasoning can be developed through a better understanding of what critical thinking entails and by practice. Critical thinking is a cognitive activity associated with using the mind. Learning to think in critically analytical and evaluative ways means using mental processes such as attention, categorization, selection and judgment. However, Many people who have the potential to develop more effective critical thinking can be prevented from doing so for a variety of reasons apart from a lack of the ability to. In particular, personal and emotional or effective reasons can create barriers. You are invited to consider in this chapter how far such barriers could be affecting your own thinking and abilities and how you will manage these. In red, we have critical thinking as a process. Critical thinking is a complex process of deliberation which involves a wide range of skills and attitudes. It includes identifying other people's positions, arguments and conclusions, evaluating the evidence for alternative points of view, weighing up opposing arguments and evidence fairly, being able to read between the lines, seeing behind surfaces and identifying false or unfair assumptions, Recognising techniques used to make certain positions more appealing than others, such as false logic and persuasive devices. Reflecting on issues in a structured way. Bringing logic and insight to bear. Drawing conclusions about whether arguments are valid and justifiable, based on good evidence and sensible assumptions. Synthesising information. Drawing together your judgments of evidence, synthesising these to form your own new position. Presenting a point of view in a structured, clear, well-reasoned way that convinces others. In pink, we then have scepticism and trust. Ennis, in 1987, identified a range of dispositions and abilities associated with critical thinking. These focused on the ability re to reflect sceptically, the ability to think in a reasoned way. Scepticism in critical thinking means bringing an element of polite doubt. In this context... Scepticism doesn't mean you must go through life never believing anything you hear and see. That would not be helpful. It does mean holding open the possibility that what you know at a given time may be only part of the picture. Critical thinking gives you the tools to use scepticism and doubt constructively so that you can analyse what is before you. It helps you to make better and more informed decisions about whether something is likely to be true, effective or productive. Ultimately, in order to function in the world, we have to accept the probability that at least some things are as they seem. This requires trust. If we can analyse clearly the basis of what we take as true, we are more likely to 
be able to discern when it is reasonable to be trusting and when it is useful to be sceptical. Then in orange we have method rather than personality trait. Some people seem to be more naturally sceptical whilst others find it easier to be trusting. These differences may be because of past experiences or personality traits. However, critical thinking is not all about natural traits or personality. It's about certain methods aimed at exploring evidence in a particular way. Skeptical people can require structured approaches that help them to trust the probability of an outcome, just as those who are more trusting require methods to help them use doubt constructively. Then in green, critical thinking argument. The focus of critical thinking is often referred to as the argument. In our third video of this series, there will be an identification of features of an argument in critical thinking. The argument can be thought of as a message that is being conveyed, whether through speech, writing, performance or other media. Critical thinking helps you to identify the obvious and hidden messages more accurately and to understand the process by which an argument is constructed. So in green we have knowing our own reasons. Critical thinking is associated with reasoning or with our capacity for rational thought. The word rational means using reasons to solve problems. Reasoning starts with ourselves. It includes having reasons for what we believe and do and being aware of what these are. Critically evaluating our own beliefs and actions. Being able to present to others the reasons for our beliefs and actions. This may sound easy as we all assume we know what we believe and why. However, sometimes when we are challenged on why we believe that something is true, it becomes obvious to us that we haven't really thought through whether what we have seen or heard is the whole story or is just one point of view. There are also likely to be occasions when we find we are not sure what we consider to be right course of action or a correct interpretation. It is important to examine the basis of our own beliefs and reasoning, as these will be the main vantage points from which we begin any critical analysis. In yellow, we then have challenging our own assumptions. Our brains like to assume that they are right. Research has shown that we are wired to make quick assumptions, to take the easiest route to jump to the most likely conclusion rather than to slow down and examine our reasoning. This means that we can easily miss essential information and omit relevant considerations. Focusing on our reasons and examining the foundations of these systematically can help us uncover our assumptions. When we are more aware of these, we can test them out too, in a systematic way. In red, we then have critical analysis of other people's reasoning. Critical reasoning usually involves considering other people's reasoning. This requires the skill of grasping an overall argument, but also skills in analysing and evaluating it in detail. Critical analysis of other people's reasons can involve identifying their reasons and conclusions, analysing how they select, combine and order reasons to construct a line of reasoning, evaluating whether their reasons support the conclusions they draw, evaluating whether their reasons are well-founded based on good evidence, identifying flaws in their reasoning. Then finally, in pink, we have constructing and presenting reasons. Reasoning involves analysing evidence and drawing conclusions from it. The evidence may then be presented in support of the conclusion. For example, we may consider that it is a cold day. Someone who disagrees may ask why we believe this. We may use evidence such as a thermometer reading and observation of weather conditions. Our reasons may be that the temperature is low and there is ice on the ground. We use basic examples of reasoning such as this every day. For professional and academic work, we are usually required to present our reasoning using formal structures such as essays or reports with recommendations. This requires additional skills such as knowing how to select and structure reasons to support a conclusion, Present an argument in a consistent way, use logical order, use language effectively to present the line of reasoning. So why do critical thinking skills matter? Well firstly in green we have sharpening our minds. As we have seen we often assume that we have the full story, the right answer or the best solution when that is not the case. 
It's easy to slip into simply repeating something we have heard or describing what we have read without much thought. We may consider that we are using critical skills when we are merely stating that we believe it to be self-obviously true. Such as thinking leads to mistakes, weak understandings, unconscious bias, unfairness and errors of judgement. Most of these won't be significant, but some could have serious consequences. Critical awareness sharpens our minds so that we are better able to identify where we need to slow down and apply more systematic critiques of our thinking processes and actions. Then in yellow we have for academic and professional life. Advances in knowledge and professional practice are made through recognising where improvements can be made to what has gone before. This involves being able to break down existing understandings and practice into their component parts, such as what are assumed to be facts or good evidence or sound methods or assumptions made about how different pieces of information are connected. Academic study and research-based inquiry require us to slow down our processing of information. The methodologies used for conducting research and the feedback received from peers help in identifying flaws in the way we arrive at our conclusions. That has an impact on speed, accuracy, efficiency and fairness of our thoughts and actions. In orange, we then have realistic self-appraisal. Good critical thinking skills, if applied well, can help us to make sure much more realistic and accurate appraisals of our own abilities, interests and thinking processes. This is useful in helping us to make decisions about where to focus our energies when looking for work, pursuing further training or making life choices. Some benefits of good critical abilities are ability to spot your own and other people's assumptions, ability to spot inconsistencies and potential errors that merit further investigation, ability to make fair, sound decisions, less likelihood of being missiled or cheated, Ability to notice what is relevant and significant, so saving time and effort. Ability to bring greater accuracy and precision to different parts of a task. Clearer thinking and communication. Being prob better problem solving skills, such as identifying where improvement could be made and evaluating potential solutions. Ability to take a systematic approach to ensure essentials are not overlooked. Greater speed and accuracy in analysing complex information. Confidence in taking on more complex problems and challenges, and possibility of seeing the world through different eyes with sharper awareness. Critical thinking rarely takes place in a vacuum. Higher level critical thinking skills usually require some or all of the skills and attitudes listed below. Firstly, in green, we have underlying thinking skills. Critical thinking assumes abilities in a range of skills, such as categorising, selection and differentiation, comparing and contrasting. These skills are examined in Chapter 2, which will be the next video. Then in orange, we have knowledge and research. Good critical thinkers can often detect a poor argument without a good knowledge of the subject. However, critical thinking usually benefits from background research. Finding out more about a subject helps you to make a more informed judgement about whether relevant facts, alternative explanations and options have been covered sufficiently. Then in red we have emotional self-management. Critical thinking sounds like a dispassionate process, but it can engage emotions and even passionate responses. This should not surprise us when we consider that reasoning requires us to decide between opposing points of view. In particular, we may not like the evidence that contradicts our own opinions or beliefs. If the evidence points in a direction that is unexpected and challenging, that can arouse unexpected feelings of anger, frustration or anxiety. The academic world traditionally likes to consider itself as illogical and immune to emotions, so if feelings do emerge, this can be especially difficult. Being able to manage your emotions under such circumstances is a useful skill. If you can remain calm and present your reasons logically, you will be able to better argue your point of view in a convincing way. Perseverance, accuracy and precision. Critical thinking involves accuracy and precision and this can require dedication to finding the right answer. It includes attention to detail, taking the time to note small clues that throw greater light on the overall issue, identifying trends and patterns, this may be through careful mapping of information, analysis of data, or identifying repetition and similarity. Repetition.
going back over the same ground several times to check that nothing has been missed. Taking different perspectives, looking at the same information from several points of view. Objectivity. Putting your own likes, beliefs and interests to one side with the aim of gaining the most accurate outcome of a, or a deeper understanding. Considering implications and distant consequences. What appears to be a good idea in the short term, for example, might have long-term effects that are less desirable. Then we have reflection, emotional self-management. For me, the emotions that are most difficult to deal with and manage when others disagree with me are, then you can fill in the blank for yourself. How do you then deal by these? Feel free to comment what your answers to these were below. Good critical thinking involves making accurate judgments. We noted above that our thinking might not be accurate if we are not fully aware of the influences that affect it. These can include such things as our own assumptions, preconceptions, bias, dislikes, beliefs, things we take for granted as normal and acceptable, and all those things that about ourselves and our world that we have never questioned. People who are outstanding at critical thinking tend to be particularly self-aware. They reflect upon and evaluate their personal motivations, interests, prejudices, expertise and gaps in their knowledge. They question their own point of view and check the evidence used to support it. Becoming more self-aware takes courage. It can be unsettling to find out things about ourselves we didn't know, as most of us like to think we know ourselves very well. It is also challenging to question our belief systems. We think of these as part of our identity and it can be quite, un quite unsettling if we find our identity to be called into question. Furthermore, the result of your critical thinking might take place in a minority amongst your friends, family or colleagues. Nobody else might interpret the evidence in the same way as you. It takes courage to argue an alternative point of view, especially when it is possible you might be wrong. So now try and answer these in the comments below too. For me, the influences on my own thinking that I need to be most aware of so they don't prejudice my thinking are, and how do you deal with these by? Then the second question is, for me, the things that I find most difficult about challenging the opinions of other people are, and how would you deal with these? Feel free to pause the video here so you can type them below. Here we are going to look at three examples of how lecturers describe critical thinking. Example 1. I may make a quick first reading to get the overall picture and check my initial response. I see whether it rings true or contradicts what I believe it to be true. I compare what I read with what I already know about the topic and with my experience. I summarise as I go along and hold the overall argument in my head to make sense of what comes next. I look for the author's position or point of view, asking what are they trying to sell me. As I read, I check this each section and ask myself if I know what it means. If not, I check again. Sometimes it is clearer when I read the second time. If it is still unclear, I remind myself to come back to it later, as the rest of the passage may make it clearer. I then read more carefully, seeing what reasons the writers present and checking whether I am persuaded by these. If I am persuaded, I consider why. Is it because they make use of the experts in the field? Is there research evidence that looks thorough and convincing? If I am not persuaded, then why not? I check whether this is a gut level thing or whether I have good reasons for not being convinced. If I have relied on a gut response, I check for hard evidence such as whether I have read other material that contradicts it. I then create my own position and check that my point of view is very convincing. Could I support it if it was challenged? Here, the lecturer is describing an overall strategy for reading, analysing the text in a critically analytical way. The final point refers to creating a personal position by synthesising the available material and then submitting this to a critical analysis too. In example two, there is an indication that as well as the words on the page or material being critiqued, there are a wider contextual and other considerations to be taken into account. I put my energy into looking for the heart of the issue, what is really being said and why. 
The answers may not be on the page, they may be in the wider history of a debate, a cultural clash or conflicting bids for project money. It is surprising how often the wider context, popular debates, even a desire to be seen, to be saying what is currently in fashion, have a bearing on what a given passage is really saying. Then the third lecturer wouldn't disagree with what has gone before, but adds another dimension. Analysis encourages a focus on the detail and considering many different angles. This can generate a large body of evidence or a long list of points for consideration. As important in aspect of your critical analysis is to sift through this wealth of information and make good judgments about what is most significant. So here is example three. The trick is being able to see the wood for the trees, identifying what is relevant amongst a mass of less relevant information. It isn't enough just to understand. You have to be constantly evaluating whether something is accurate, whether it gets the heart of the issue, whether it is the most important aspect on which to focus, whether it is the best example to use, and whether what you are saying about it is a fair representation of it. All three examples illustrate different aspects of critical thinking process, an analytical strategy for the material, understanding of wider context, an evaluative and selective approach, being self-critical about your own understanding, interpretation and evaluation. So now we look into critical thinking in academic contexts starting with development of understanding. Students are expected to develop critical thinking skills so that they can dig deeper below the surface of the subject they are studying and engage in critical dialogue with its main theories and arguments. This usually through engaging critical debates in seminars, presentations or writing produced for assessment or publication. One of the best ways of arriving at a point where we really understand something is by doing or replicating the underlying research for ourselves. However, as undergraduates the and indeed in everyday life, there simply isn't time to research everything we encounter. The depth of understanding that comes through direct experience, practice and experimentation has to be replaced at times by critical analysis of the work of other people. Students need to develop the ability to evaluate critically the work of others. While some find this easy, others tend to accept or apply the results of other people's research too readily, without analysing it sufficiently to check that the evidence and reasoning really support the main points being made. Bodner, for example, describes chemistry students as being unable to apply their knowledge outside the narrow domain in which it was learnt. They know without understanding. Bodner suggests that instead of focusing primarily on standard chemical calculations in books, students should be looking for answers to questions such as how do we know and why do we believe. Bodner's description is likely to be just as true of students in other subjects. It is not unusual for students and other people generally to rely unquestioningly on research that is based on a small sample of the population, or that is based on faulty reasoning, or that is now out of date. Evidence from small or isolated projects is often treated as if it were irrefutable proof of a general principle, and is sometimes quoted year after year as if it were absolute truth. Chapter 8 looks further at critically examining and evaluating evidence. So then we can look at knowledge without understanding as a reflection. Do you recognise anything of yourself in Bodner's description of students? What effect would the approach he suggests have on your learning and understanding? Please comment this below. Then in yellow we have both positives and negatives. In academic context, criticism refers to an analysis of positive features as well as negative ones. It is important to identify strengths and satisfactory aspects rather than just weaknesses to evaluate what works as well as what does not good critical analysis works as well good critical analysis accounts for why something is good or poor why it works or fails it is not nearly um, it is not merely enough to list good and bad points then in orange we have comprehensive nothing is excluded for most academic programs, students are expected to take 
well-reasoned, evidence-based, critical approach to what they hear, see, read, and learn. That is the case even when considering the work of respected academics. Normally, any theory, perspective, data, area of research, or approach to discipline could be subjected to critical analysis. Some colleges, such as religious foundations, may consider certain subjects to be out of bounds, but this is not typical. In red, we have the idea or the action, not the person. A distinction is usually drawn between the idea, work, text, theory, or behavior, one on the other hand, and on the other. This is also true when making critical analysis of other students' work, if this is a requirement of your course. Even so, it is worth remembering that people identify closely with their work and may take criticism of it personally. Tact and a constructive approach are needed. Giving difficult messages in a way other people can accept is an important aspect of critical evaluation. Then in pink, we have non-dualistic. In our day-to-day -day lives, we can slip into thinking everything is right or wrong, black or white. In the academic world, answers may occur at the point on a continuum of possibilities. One of the purposes of higher level thinking is to address questions which are more complicated and sophisticated and which do not lend themselves to straightforward responses. You may have noticed yourself that the more you know about a subject, the more difficult it becomes to give simple answers. Then in purple we have dealing with ambiguity and doubt. With the internet at our fingertips we are used to obtaining answers within minutes or formulating a question. However in the academic world questions are raised in new areas and answers may not be found for years or even lifetimes. This can feel uncomfortable if you are used to ready answers. This does not mean though that the vague answers are acceptable. If you look at articles in academic journals, you will see that they are very closely argued, often focusing on a minute aspect of the subject in great detail and with precision. Students too are expected to develop skills in using evidence, even if drawn from other people's research, to support a detailed line of reasoning. It is worth remembering that in academic work, including professional research for business and industry, researchers often need to pursue lines of inquiry knowing that no clear answers may emerge, it may take decades to gain an answer, or they may contribute only a very small part to a much larger picture. So, what does critical analysis mean as a student? It means finding out where the best evidence lies for the subject you are discussing, evaluating the strength of the evidence to support different arguments, coming to an interim conclusion about where the available evidence appears to lead, constructing a line of reasoning to guide your audience through the evidence and lead them towards your conclusion, selecting the best examples and providing evidence to illustrate your argument. Critical thinking does not come easily to everyone. Barriers vary from person to person, but can usually be overcome. This section looks at the key barriers to critical thinking and encourages you to consider whether these might be having an impact on you. Firstly, in pink, we have misunderstanding what is meant by criticism. Some people assume that criticism means making negative comments. As a result, they refer only to negative aspects when making an analysis. This is a misunderstanding of the term. As we saw above, critical evaluation means in identifying positive and as well as negative aspects, what works as well as what does not. Others feel that it is not good to engage in criticism because it is an intrinsically negative activity. Some worry that they will be regarded as an unpleasant sort of person if they are good at making criticism. As a result, they avoid making any comments they feel are negative and make only positive comments. They may not provide feedback on what can be improved. This is often an unhelpful approach as constructive criticism can clarify a situation and make people excel. Then in purple we have overestimating our own reasoning abilities. Most of us like to think of ourselves as rational beings. We tend to believe our own belief systems are the best, otherwise we wouldn't hold those beliefs, and that we have good reasons for what we do and think. Although this is true of most of us, for some of the time, it isn't an accurate picture of how humans behave. Most of the time, our thinking runs on automatic. This means us 
This makes us more efficient in our everyday lives. We don't have to doubt the safety of a toothbrush every time we brush our teeth. However, it is easy to fall into poor thinking habits. People who get their own way or simply get by with poor reasoning may believe that their reasoning must be good as nobody has said it isn't. Those who are good at winning arguments can mistake this for good reasoning ability. Winning an argument does not necessarily mean that you have the best case. It may simply mean that your opponents didn't recognise a poor argument or chose to yield the point of for their own reasons, such as to avoid conflict. Imprecise, inaccurate and illogical thinking does not help to develop the mental abilities required for higher level academic and professional work. In red, we then have lack of methods, strategies or practice. Although willing to be more critical, some people don't know which steps to take next in order to improve their critical thinking skills. Others are unaware that strategies used for study at school and in everyday situations are not sufficiently rigorous for higher level academic thinking and professional work. With practice, most people can develop their skills in critical thinking. In orange, we then have reluctance to critique experts. There can be a natural anxiety about critically analysing texts or other works by people that you respect. It can seem strange for students to know little about their subject, to be asked to critique works by those who are clearly more experienced. Some students can find it alien, rude or nonsensical to offer criticism of practitioners they know to be more expert than themselves. If this is true, it may help to bear in mind that this is a part of way of teaching that works in most universities. Critical analysis is a typical and expected activity. Researchers and lecturers expect students to question and challenge even published material. It can take time to adapt to this way of thinking. If you are confident about critical thinking, bear in mind that there are others who find this difficult. In many parts of the world, students are expected to demonstrate respect for known expert by behaviours such as learning text off by heart, repeating the exact words used by an expert, copying images precisely or imitating movements as closely as possible. Students of martial arts such as Tai Chi or Karate may be familiar with this approach to teaching and learning. Then in yellow we have effective reasons. We saw above that emotional management can play an important part in critical thinking. To be able to critique means being able to acknowledge that there is more than one way of looking at an issue. In academic contexts, the implications of a theory can challenge deeply held beliefs and long held assumptions. This can be difficult to accept, irrespective of how intelligent a student may be. This is especially so if common sense or normality appears to be challenged by other intellectuals intelligent people or by academic research. It can be hard to hear deeply held religious, political and ideological beliefs challenged in any way at all. Other sensitive issues include views on bringing up children, criminal justice, genetic modification and sexuality. When we are distressed by what we are learning, the emotional response may help to focus our thinking, but very often it can inhibit our capacity to think clearly. Emotional content can add power to an argument, but it can also undermine an argument, especially if emotions seem to take place of the reasoning and evidence that could convince others. Critical thinking does not mean that you must abandon beliefs that are important to you. It may mean giving more consideration to the evidence that supports the arguments based on those beliefs so that you do justice to your point of view. In the light green colour, we then have mistaking information for understanding. Learning is a process that develops understanding and insight. Many lecturers set activities to develop expertise in methods used with the discipline. However, students can misunderstand the purpose of such teaching methods, referring facts and answers rather than learning the skills that help them make, to make well-founded judgments for themselves. Cal, Keeley, Schemberg and Zinboa write about students' natural resistance to learning to think critically, which can mean acquiring through new learning behaviours. Cowell et al. outline the problem through the following dialogue. Student, I want you, the expert, to give me answers to the questions. I want to know the right answer. Teachers, I want you to become critical thinkers, which means I want you to challenge experts' answers and pursue your own answers through active questioning. This means lots of hard work. 
If you feel that critical thinking is hard work at times, then you are right. There are lecturers who would agree with you. However, if it wasn't difficult, you would not be developing your own thinking skills into new areas. In effect, you are developing your mental muscle when you improve your critical thinking skills. Then in dark green, we have insufficient focus and attention to detail. Critical thinking involves precision and accuracy, and this in turn requires good attention to detail. Poor criticism can result from making judgments based on too general an overview of the subject matter. Critical thinking activities require focus on the exact task in hand, rather than becoming distracted by other interesting tangents. When critically evaluating arguments, it is important to remember that you can find an argument to be good or effective, even if you don't agree with it. So, which barriers have an effect on you? Below in the comments, tell me which of these barriers you consider might be affecting your thinking abilities. Do you misunderstand what is meant by criticism? Are you overestimating your reasoning abilities? Do you have a lack of method and strategy? Do you have lack of practice? Are you reluctant to criticise those with more expertise? Are you using effective reasons? Are you mistaking information for understanding? Do you have insufficient focus and attention to detail? Consider what you would do to manage these barriers in the next few months. So now we go on to self-evaluation. For each of the following statements, rate your responses as outlined below. Note that strongly disagree carries no score. So rate the statement as a 4 if you strongly agree, a 3 if you agree, 2 if you sort of agree, and 1 if you, agree, if you disagree, 0 if you strongly disagree. And write your answers in the comments below. Number 1. I feel comfortable pointing out potential weaknesses in the work of experts. 2. I can remain focused at the exact requirements of an activity. 3. I know the different meanings of the word argument in critical thinking. 4. I can analyse the structure of an argument. 5. I can offer criticism without feeling this makes me a bad person. 6. I know what it is meant by line of reasoning. 7. I am aware of how my current beliefs might prejudice fair consideration of an issue. 8. I am patient in identifying the line of reasoning in an argument. 9. I am good at recognising the signals used to indicate stages in an argument. 10. I find it easy to separate key points from other material. 11. I am very patient in going over the facts in order to reach an accurate view. 12. I am good at identifying unfair techniques used to per persuade readers. 13. I am good at reading between the lines. 14. I find it easy to evaluate the evidence to support a point of view. I usually pay attention to small details. Sorry, that was 15. <laughs> 16. I find it easy to weigh up different points of view fairly. 17. No, 18. I can present my own arguments clearly. 19. I understand how to structure an argument. 20. I can tell descriptive writing from analytical writing. 21. I can spot inconsistencies in an argument easily. 22. I am good at identifying patterns. 23. I am aware of how my up own upbringing might prejudice fair consideration of an issue. 24. I know how to evaluate source materials. 25. I understand why ambiguous language is often used in research papers. This score is out of 100. Now we move on to interpreting your score. Just so you know, my score was 69. So if you scored higher than me, then congratulations. You should probably be doing this series instead of me. <laughs> so moving on to interpreting your score. Going through the questionnaire may have raised some questions about what you know or don't know about critical thinking. The lower the score, the more like you are, likely you are to need to develop your critical thinking skills. A score over 75 suggests that you are very confident about your critical thinking ability. It is worth checking this against objective feedback from your tutors or colleagues, for example. If your score is less than 100, there is still room for improvement. 
If your score is under 45 or remains so after completing the book, you may find it helpful to speak to an academic counsellor, your tutor or a supervisor to root out the difficulty. So the interpretation of my score as an example shows that I am moderately confident with my thinking skills, but I can definitely improve. I can also see which areas I desperately need to improve in as some of my answers had ratings of just one. So now we move on to priorities to develop our critical thinking abilities. Complete these below to find your priorities for improvement. You may find that you don't need to watch every single video on this series. You should select at least three priorities from the list to structure which videos are most important to your learning. I found that I need to learn how to present my own arguments. I want to learn how to apply critical thinking to my notes. And I want to learn to evaluate source materials better. So, in summary, critical thinking is a process that relies upon and develops a wide range of skills and personal qualities. Like other forms of activity, it improves with practice and with a proper sense of what is required. For some people, this may mean changing behaviours, such as paying attention to detail or taking a more sceptical approach to what they see, hear and read. Some people need to focus on developing critical thinking techniques, and this is the main purpose of this series. For others, weaknesses in critical thinking abilities may stem from attitudes to criticism and anxiety about potential consequences, barriers associated with at attitudinal and effective responses to critical approaches were considered in this chapter. Sometimes it is sufficient to become more aware of these barriers and to recognise the blocks to effective thinking, for the anxieties to subside. If you find that these difficulties persist, it is worth speaking to a student counsellor about your concerns. They may be familiar with such responses and may be able to help you with find a solution that fits your personal circumstances. Developing good critical thinking skills can take patience and application. On the other hand, the rewards lie in improved abilities in making judgments, seeing more easily through flawed reasoning, making choices from a more informed position, and improving your ability to influence others. Having undertaken an initial personal evaluation of your critical thinking skills, you may now wish to follow up on these priorities you identified. This is a particularly useful approach if you have already worked on your critical thinking skills. If you are new to critical thinking, you may find it useful to progress directly to the next video in order to test and practice your underlying thinking skills. Alternatively, you can proceed to the third video and work through the chapters in turn to develop a systematic approach to enhancing your critical thinking abilities. Thank you so much for watching this video guys, I will hope to see you in the next one, please subscribe to this channel if you want to carry on watching this series or if you want to learn anything about crime, politics, sociology, history, Shakespeare, business, religion, economics, philosophy or ethics and I'm even starting to look into things like serial killers and cults so if any of that interests you please go check out my channel. Or if you want to carry on with this series then ring the notification bell because there are more videos coming soon. Or there are a bunch of videos already up so you should really go check them out. Thank you so much for watching guys. Please comment below your thoughts and if you want to do any of the activities in this video that is awesome too. Remember to pause the video if you ever need to. So yeah, thanks for watching. Bye guys!